Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and a brand new series of videos aimed at helping you prepare for your GCSE mathematics exams. In this series I'll be giving a complete walkthrough of the GCSE mathematics practice papers to help you prepare for your exams this summer. Now there are not so many of these and you don't want to squander them so make sure you try the paper yourself first before you look at these solutions. This particular paper is OCR June 2022, Paper 2, Foundation Tip. Check the front cover of your paper to make sure it's the same one. If it's not, have a look through the playlist linked above which includes all the GCSE mass video walkthroughs I've recorded so far. I'm busy recording all of the GCSE practice papers, so if the one you're looking for isn't there already, why not subscribe by clicking the big red button below and check back in a few days. Don't forget to click on the bell so that you'll get a notification when I upload the next paper. I'll put timestamps in the description below so you can choose to watch the whole thing through or you can click on the timestamp and jump to the particular question you need help with. If you have a question, check the comments below as someone else might have already asked the same thing. If it's a new question, Leave it in the comments and I will try and answer all of them as soon as I can. Don't forget to mention which question on the paper you're referring to and try and be as specific as possible. Finally, if this video helps you with your revision, please give it a thumbs up. It will really help me out and why not share the link with your friends because they might need a helping hand too. Okay, let's get into it. Question 1a, work out 4 minus 5. Now, if you struggle with positive and negative numbers, it may be worth your while spending a minute or two drawing a number line somewhere on your paper, which you can use for every question that comes up with positive and negative numbers. Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly make one here. And so on. So then if you've got a question like what's four minus five, you can then go and find four on the number line uh, and then you can subtract five from it. One, two, three, four, five. You can take it down to minus one, and then you're not going to make any silly mistakes with, uh, with it. So you know, if you know you struggle with positive and negatives, and and believe me, lots of students do, then you know, just taking a few minutes to draw out that number line at the beginning of the paper will probably save you quite a few marks throughout the paper. Okay, part two says what two times negative three. Uh, when you're multiplying positive and negative numbers, you don't use the number line. You just Multiply the two numbers together, two times three is six. And when you work out what the sign is, a positive times a negative is always a negative. So quite, that's actually easier to do multiplication with positive negatives than it is than to do addition. Part three says, what's one seventh plus two sevenths? So we've got a fraction here, it's got the same denominator. That means we can just go ahead and add the numerators together. So one plus two is three. It's gonna be three sevenths, isn't it? Not sure what that weird seven is doing there. Uh, next one says, what's half of one and a half? Now, half of one and a half means what is a half multiplied by one and a half? And one and a half as a top heavy fraction would be a half times three over two. And then fraction multiplication, we times top by top, one times three is three. And we multiply and we multiply bottom with bottom, so two times two, well, that's four, isn't it? Okay, so the answer is three over four, three quarters. Three quarters. Uh, write down the largest prime factor of 30. If I wanted to find the factors of 30, I'd start with a little bubble at the top, and I'd think of, well, what two numbers multiply together to give me 30? Well, it could be three and 10. There are others available. Three is prime. 10 isn't, so I'm going to break that one down a bit further. 2 times 5 is 10. Now they're both primes, so 30 is equal to 2 times 3 times 5 as a product of its primes. So the largest prime factor is going to be that 5 on the end there, then, isn't it? So it's going to be 5. Question 2a, what fraction of the shape is shaded? Well, this rectangle is divided into three pieces, so that's my denominator of which two are shaded, so that's my numerator, two thirds. Uh, part B says, what percentage of this shape is shaded? 
Well, there's a fraction doing the same thing. There are four pieces all together here, so that's the denominator, three of which are shaded. So three quarters are shaded. Now, if I want to make that into a percentage, the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite that as a fraction over 100, aren't I? So how many times does 4 go into 100? Well, if I multiply 4 by 25, I'd get 100. So if I do the same thing with the numerator, if I times that by 25, I'm going to get 75 over 100, which is 75%. So that's my answer, 75. Part C says, write 0 0.2 as a fraction, give your answer in its simplest form. Well, this digit here in a number is the tenths column, isn't it? So you've got like hundreds, tens, units, tenths, hundreds. So that one's tenths. So 0 0.2 is the same thing as two tenths. Now, both those numbers are, are multiples of two. So divide them both by two. I'm going to get 1 over 5, which is the fraction in its simplest form, 1 fifth. Part D says work out 80% of 30. Well, if 100% of my number is 30, then 10% would be 3 then, wouldn't it? So another 10% would be another 3. So then 20% is going to be 3 plus 3 is going to be 6. So then I can work out 80% by taking 100% and subtracting 20%, and that would give me 80%, wouldn't it? So 100 take away 20 is 80, 30 take away 6, that's 24, so my answer is 24. You could also do it with uh, by finding 50, 10, and 10, and 10. That would also work, okay? but. That's kind of the way I thought about doing it. Question three, bananas cost 25p each. How much can be bought for two pounds? Well, if they're 25p each, then I could get two bananas for 50p, which means I could get four bananas for a pound, uh, which means I could get eight bananas for two pounds. Just double, double, double then, isn't it? Okay, so I think I can get eight. Question four, a student makes a fair-sided spinner. They write the numbers 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 on the spinner. Write down the probability of the student spinner landing on a number which is less than 12. Okay, well, probability is always the successful outcome divided by total outcomes. So the probability that it's less than 12. Uh, how many outcomes are less than 12? Well, there's only one, isn't there? There's there's one that's less than 12, that's 11. So there's one outcome that's less than 12. And how many outcomes are there all together? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, isn't there? So the probability then it is less than 12 is going to be one over eight. Find the probability of a student spinner landing on a multiple of three. Okay, well, what are the multiples of three? So you've got three, six, nine, none of which are on there. And then you've got 12, 15, 18. So you've got three multiples of three on the spinner. So that means there's probability of multiple of three is going to be three successful outcomes over a total of eight outcomes. Question five, write the ratio five to seven and a half in its simplest form. Okay, well, now at the moment, I've got like a half in here, so we can't really leave a half in a ratio like that if it's gonna be in its simplest form. So the easiest way of getting rid of it, I guess, is just to double both sides. So if I double both sides, so times two times two, I'm gonna get 10 to seven and a half times two is gonna be 15, isn't it? So that's the same thing as 10 to 15. Now 10 and 15 are both multiples of five, so I guess I can divide them both by 5 then, can't I? So if I divide 15 by 5, I'm going to get 3. And if I'm going to divide 10 by 5, uh, I'm going to get 2. So in its simplest form then, that is the ratio of 2 to 3. Question 6. Taylor has collected data on the number of students who were absent from their school last week. The bar chart shows the results for the first four days. 
On Friday, there were 54 students who were absent from the school. Show this information on the bar chart. Okay, so 54, where's that? Let's have a look at this section here. It's going to be somewhere between uh, 50 and 60. Now, there are one, two, three, four, five divisions spanning 10 units there. So 10 divided by 5, that's 2. That's That means each one of those is worth 2. So 54 is going to be that second one, isn't it? 50, 52, 54, 54 is going to be there. Okay, so uh, on my bar chart then, I need to draw one which is of a height 54 at Friday. So and what's that's about? Hot, one of those unity things on my scale, it's handy. So put it at 54. Should try and make the bar the same sort of width as all the other bars. Don't want it looking out of place and at the right height. Uh, colouring in is optional. Students like to colour them in though. Don't get any extra marks for colouring them in. Just need to make sure they're the right width and the right height really. Uh, Taylor says on Monday 150% of the students were absent from my school. Could this be true? Explain how you decide. On Monday 150% of the students were absent from my school. That does not make any sense can't have more than 100%, can you? So in this context, you can't. I mean, in some contexts, you can have over 100%, but if you're doing percentages of students, you can't have more than all of the students, 100% of the students being absent. So I'm going to say no. Um, um, maximum would be 100%. Okay, question 7a, multiply out 5 lots of x plus 2. So when we've got a bracket like this on, and a number on the outside, we multiply everything on the inside with that number on the outside. So 5 times x is 5x, and 5 times 2, well that's 10, so that's my answer then. 5x plus 10. Uh, part b says rearrange the formula to make r the subject. Now, when you're rearranging formula, you can do it pretty much the same way as when you're solving an equation, um, but rather than reducing down to a single number at the end on the other side from your unknown, uh, it just everything piles up on the other side. So for this one here, I want to get r by itself. So if I add 5 to both sides, that's going to cancel. And it's going to leave me with just 3r on the right. On the left, I had p to start with, and then I've added another 5. Now, if this was an equation, it would be a number, and I'd add another number, and I'd get one number. But with rearranging equations, like I say, it gets less complicated on one side and more complicated on the other. So dividing both sides by 3 next, that's going to cancel with that, leaving me with r on the right-hand side. And on the left hand side, well, I'm going to have what I've just written down there on. I'm going to get P plus 5 over 3. So that's my final answer. I'm just going to spin it around the other way and write R equals P plus 5 over 3 as my final answer, like that. Okay? Question 8a work out 3.08 plus 0 0.82. Now, for this one, uh, I'm going to line up the decimals. So 3.08 plus 0 0.82. 82, making sure the decimals are aligned. Yes, they are, look. And then I can just add up along the columns then, can't I then? So 8 plus 2, that's 10. 0 carry 1. 1, 0 and 8 make 9. And 3 and 0 make 3. So that becomes 3.90. I'm just going to write that down as 3.9. I don't need to write that extra 0 down. 7.7 uh, 7 divided by 11. 11 into 7.7. .7. Well, 11s into 7 don't go, do they? They go in 0 times. So carrying the 7 along. 11s into 77, that goes 7 times. So it's going to be 0 0.7. 0 0.7. Uh, work out 2.1 minus 3 fifths times 0 0.3. I seem to have an extra bracket there. What's going on there then? 
Okay, I think that's just a print and error. That should be there. Okay, so I've got 2.1 minus 3 fifths times 0 0.3. Now I need to do, I need to give my answer as a decimal. So it makes sense to convert 3 fifths into a decimal first, because the other two things are as decimals as well, aren't they? So what's 3 fifths as a decimal? Well, 3 fifths is the same thing as 6 over 10, and that's the same thing as 0 0.6, isn't it? So what I've got is 2.1 minus 0 0.6 times 0.3 that's what I need to work out so what's 2.1 minus 0.6 2.1 minus 0.6 uh, 6 I can't take away from 2 so make that 1 make that 1 11 take away 6 is 5 1 take away 0 is 1 so that's 1.5 so the brackets becomes 1.5 I need to do brackets first remember and then times that by 0 0.3. So what's 1.5 times 0 0.3? So 5 threes are 15. 1 threes 3 plus 1 is 4. Uh, that's it, isn't it? So then I've got one, two digits behind the decimal place in my question. So I'm going to have two digits behind the decimal place in my answer. So it's going to be 0 0.45 then. So that's my final answer, 0.45. Okay. Question nine. A local theatre is putting on a show. 50 child tickets are sold. The ratio of number of child tickets sold to the number of adult tickets sold is 5 to 2. The cost of a child ticket is £2.50. The cost of an adult ticket is £5. Work out the total amount paid for the tickets. Okay, so let's start with the ratio of child to adult tickets, which is in the ratio of 5 to 2. Okay, I've got that from there. Look. So, child tickets to adult tickets is 5 to 2. Got to get them in the right order. Okay, now I know that there were 50 child tickets are sold. So right in the 50 child tickets that I got from there in the in the child column, I can see then that my ratio is going to have to multiply up by a power of 10. It's going to be 10 times bigger. So if I do the same thing to this side, times it by 10, then I know that if there were 50 child tickets, there must have been 20 adult tickets. Okay. So I know that the cost of a child ticket is £2.50. And I know I've got 50 of those. So from the child tickets, I'd have sold 50 at £2.50. Okay, now I could do that by long multiplication. Uh, but another way of doing it, I might just take like 50 is 5 times 10. So if I take 10 out of the 50 and kind of put it into the £2.50, that's the same thing as 5 times 25, which is easier to do in my head. Uh, so 5 times 25, that's 125, isn't it? So we get £125 from the child tickets. Uh, for the adult tickets, uh, if that confused you, you can just multiply it out normally. Uh, but it kind of made sense to me. Uh, with the adult tickets, that's 20 tickets sold. So... That came from there, that came from there. And then so for the adult tickets, they were 20 of those and they cost five pounds. So 20 times five. Well, that's fairly easy to do. That's just a hundred, isn't it? Okay. So then the total is gonna be the 125 from the child tickets plus the hundred from the adult tickets, that comes to 225. And is now it's my final answer, 225. Question 10, the diagram shows Kai's garden. It's in the shape of a right angle triangle. Kai is going to spread grass seed on the garden. A bag of grass seed covers an area of 35 square meters. Each bag of grass seed costs £8.99. Kai can only buy whole bags of grass seeds. Kai buys uh, the least number of bags he needs for the garden. Calculate the cost of buying the bags of grass seeds that Kai needs. You must show your work in. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need to do is then work out the area of this triangle, then, isn't it? If we work out what the square meterage of the garden is to start with, we can then use that to work out uh, how many of these bags that we need. And once we know the number of bags, then we can use the cost of each bag to work out how much he's spending then. Okay, 
that's the plan of action. So the first thing is to work out the area of the triangle. So area is equal to, for a triangle, the, the form is half times base times height, isn't it? So uh, that's a half times the base is 20 and the height is 15. So then that's going to give me, well, half of 20 is 10 and 10 times 15 is 150. So that's 150 square meters then. OK, so we've worked out the area is 150 square meters from the diagram. So then how many of these grass seeds packs am I going to need then? So if one pack covers 35, then two packs is going to cover 70. Just doubling that again, four packs is going to be 140. There's still not enough, is it? I'm going to need a fifth pack which will cover 140 plus 35, that'd be 175. So it's more than I need, but four would be two less. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to purchase five bags of seeds. So I need to know what five lots of eight pound 99 are. So cost is equal to uh, five times eight pounds 99. Now again, I could do that by long multiplication. I'm, not, I'm gonna just make it life easier for myself by multiplying five by nine. 5 times 9 is 45, and then taking off of 5 lots of 1p. So I make that £44.95. Question 11. Some students were asked how they travelled to school. Each student gave one answer. The pie chart shows the proportion who travelled by bus, by train or walk. Part A says all the remaining students travelled to school either by bike or car. The ratio of the number who travel by bike to the number who travel by car is two to three. Complete the pie chart. You must show your work in. Now, we don't know how many students were surveyed. So there's no point trying to work out exactly what each number these represent. I'm just going to go with the 360 degrees that you've got in a full turn as everybody. So I'm going to, I'm going to consider or let the total So I'm just going to let the total be 360, okay? So then I've already got 160, 60, and 20. So 360 minus 160 plus 60 plus 20, the other three angles, they add up to, what's that, uh, 240. So 360 minus 240, that leaves me with 120 degrees then to share out between the number of people who travel by bike or car. Okay, so we know that we need to divide 120 in a ratio of 2 to 3. Now, when you're dividing by a ratio, what you want to do is you want to add the two parts together. So 2 plus 3, taking the ratio and adding the two bits together. That's going to give me five shares. Uh, then what we need to do is we're going to divide the number we want to divide by that number of shares then, aren't we? Okay, so 120 divided by five. Um, what's that then? 120 divided by five. Five's into 120. Same thing as 10's into 240. It's going to be uh, 24. So each share is worth a value of 24. So then taking our original ratio of 2 to 3 and scaling it up by a factor of 24, both sides. So four uh, 2 times 24, that's going to be 48. And 3 times 24, that's going to be 72. You might want to just double check that adds up to... 120 which it does so I'm gonna to have to divide this up now into a 48 degree angle and a 24 degree angle so what you want to do is put your protractor over that line at the top I'm probably going to measure the 48 degree angle uh, so I'm gonna put my line up my protractor with the, the, the vertical line making sure the center of the protractor is in the center of my pie chart and I'm going to count around to 48 and make a mark and then removing the protractor i can just then join that mark up with my ruler and then i've got my 48 degree angle and it should at the same time just draw me the other part the 72 degree angle as well okay uh, now 
just to finish it off, just need to label which is which. The smaller one of the two was bike, wasn't it? So let's label that, and the other one was car. Now you would lose a mark if you forgot to label them, so make sure you label them. Part B says, which way of traveling to school is the mode? Well, mode just means most. So it's just gonna be the biggest sector in the pie chart, and that is clearly bus. So it's going to be bus. Question three, dinosaurs first appeared on Earth 2.4 times 10 to the eight years ago. And then dinosaurs became extinct on Earth seven times 10 to the seven years ago. Explain why it's appropriate to use standard form for these numbers. Well, it's appropriate because the numbers are very large, aren't they? And you've got lots of zeros on the end. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to say numbers are large. With lots of zeros. Making them hard to read, I guess. Standard form makes the magnitude of numbers clear. Part B says use the given information to work out how long the dinosaurs existed on Earth. Give your answer in standard form. Right, now to work out how many years they existed, I'm going to have to take one um, number and take away the other, aren't I? So if I take the 2.4 times 10 to the 8 number and I subtract the 7 times 10 to the 7 number, I should get my answer. Okay, now the problem here is I've got different um, parts here and here, so it makes it very difficult to subtract. I need to try and get these the same. And the easiest way to do that is to kind of break a 10 out of that first one. So kind of taking a 10 out of there and times it into the, the 2.4, I'm going to get 24 times 10 to the 7, and I'm going to subtract 7 times 10 to the 7. Okay, and so what's that then? So 24 take away 7, that's 17. And uh, it's just going to be 17 times 10 to the 7 again, isn't, isn't it? Okay, uh, but that's not quite in standard form. I now need to kind of switch it back again. So if I take a 10 out of this uh, by dividing it by 10 and then kind of adding it back into there, I'm going to get uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 8 as my final answer. Okay, so that's then back into standard form again. So 1.7 times 10 to the 8. Question 4a, complete this statement by writing the missing power in the box. And I've got 784 is equal to 2 to the power of something times 7 squared. Okay, so basically what I need to do here is to rewrite 784 as a product of its prime factors. Okay, so if I, if I were to do that, if I was to take 284 and think of two numbers that multiply together to give it, uh, I could take 2 out, then half of 784, what's that? Uh, 350 and 42, that's 392, it's half of 784. Uh, 392 has got a 2 in it, so let's take another 2 out. Uh, so that's going to give me half of 392, that's 150 and 46, so that's 196. These are horrible numbers to half. Uh, and then do that again there, I can half 196, I can take another 2 out, and then half of 196 is 98, and then that breaks down into 2 and 49, and then the 49 gives me the two sevens. Okay, so then how many twos have I got then? I've, my two sevens look, that, that's what's there, and then I've got um, 1, 2, 3, 4, four twos. So that's two to the power of four times seven squared. And that's going to give me 784 again. Okay. Uh, part B says, use your answer to part A to find the value of the root of 784. Okay. Well, uh, the root of 784 then is going to be the same thing as the root of two to the power of four 
times 7 squared because I, I know that 784 is 2 to the power of 4 times 7 squared. Uh, now a root sheet can break up if you've got two things multiplied together under a root you can break it off into two separate roots like that. Uh, 7 squared is pretty easy that's going to be 7 when you square root it. Square root of 2 to the power of 4 well 2 squared times 2 squared is 2 to the 4 so that's going to give me 2 squared. 2 squared times 7 uh, 4 times 7 that's 28 then. So the root of 784 is going to be 28. Question 14. Rectangle A and rectangle B are drawn on the coordinate grid. Describe fully two different single transformations that map triangle A onto triangle B. Okay. Well, first up we could, and the most obvious one I think, is a translation, isn't it? I could draw a vector running from the top right corner of A down to the top right corner of B, like that. Uh, and you can see I could use the same vector to map every other uh, corner. So I could map, oh, I was jumping around so much, but I could, I could map the bottom corner to the bottom corner like that, and the bottom corner to the bottom corner like that, if it wasn't jumping around so much, and so on. So this same vector describes every translation on this diagram, if it wasn't jumping around like a crazy thing. Okay, now to describe that translation, that's called a translation when you pick something up and move it. So I'm going to have to write down the word translation. And then I'm going to be using vector, and then I need to write what the vector is. Okay, now a vector is always written down in the form x over y, like that, where x is the change in x. So that's like one, two, three, four, five units in that direction. And the y number is the change in y. And that's uh, that's four there, but that's down. So it's going to be positive five, negative four like that. So five along and negative four up, which is four down. Okay, so that's the first type of transformation we could describe. We could say it is a translation. Now, the other thing that we could do is we could rotate it. We could rotate it around this point here, okay? If I rotated it 180 degrees around this point here, it's going to end up again on top of B. So my second type of transformation is a rotation. Now, to describe a rotation, you need to name three things. You have to say it's a rotation. You need to say um, about which point and how far. So how far am I rotating? It's 180 degrees. Now, normally you'd have to say a direction, either anti-clockwise or clockwise, but for 100 de 180 degrees, it doesn't matter which way around you go, you end up in the same place. So you can just write down 180. So rotation of 180 degrees about, and then we need to name the center rotation, which is that coordinate that I've marked there. So that's the coordinate the zero, minus two. Now I spotted that um, that coordinate straight away because I've kind of got a good eye for it. If you're not quite so good at doing this, if you just get some tracing paper, trace A and then guess where you think the, the center is and rotate it and see if it lands on it. Normally you can kind of get to the right place with a few rotations if, um, you know, just by trial and error. Question 15, why is inversely proportional to x? Why is 20 when x is 3? Find out the value when, of y when x is 12. Okay, now, you've got to take your time with these. There are certain steps that you need to go through. Now, the first step is from this relationship that we're given here. y is inversely proportional to x. Now, to write that down using the right notation, that means y is proportional to 1 over x. y is inversely proportional to x. So that comes from the yellow bit. Okay, that's what that tells me. Now that symbol of proportionality, the little fishy symbol, you can then replace with an equal sign as long as you multiply through by a, the constant of proportionality k. So that is equal to y equals k over x. So we're basically replacing the, the symbol of proportionality with this equals k part, okay? Uh, so then when we, what we've got now is we've got a partial formula in y and x. We just need to work out what k is. Now that's what this value set of values here is for. 
It's always giving me a pair of values that go together, and that's for working out what k is. So we're going to use that bit next. So when y is 20, x is 3. So I'm going to substitute those two values into my partial equation, and then the only thing left there will be k, which we can then work out how much k is. So if y is 20, uh, and when x is 3, then 20 equals k over 3. So that came from the blue bits. Okay, so then rearranging that for k, multiplying both sides through by 3, times by 3 times by 3, that will cancel there, leaving me with k. And 3 times 20 is 60. So I know then that k is 60. Now, now I know what k is, I can replace it up here look, where, where the k was there. So I could say then, therefore, equation is y is equal to 60 over x okay once you find once you find k and you replace it in your expression that's it you never have to think about k again but we might have to go on and use the expression which we have to do in this case it says find the value of y when x is 12. so once we have finally got the whole equation down like this we can go on to use it to find particular values so when x is 12 y is going to be 60 divided by that value of x. So when x is 12, then I'm going to get y is 60 over 12, then aren't I? Okay, so that, that was substituted into there. 12 goes into 60, what, five times? So y is equal to five. So y is equal to five when x is equal to 12, okay? Now, with these sort of questions, like I say, before I could get on to this bit, the actual question part, I had to do all of this work first, and I? I had to do all of that first. Okay, so just bear that in mind on these. Now, I actually find these quite easy to do. Once you've done a few of them, they're always exactly the same. So, yeah, practice. Question 16. A town square has a fountain F at the centre. There is also a bell tower at B and a statue at S. The bearing of the statue from the fountain is x degrees. Part A says the bearing of the bell tower from the fountain is 140 degrees more than the bearing of the statue from the fountain. Write down in terms of x the bearing of the bell tower from the fountain. Okay, now uh, I think the bearing of the bell tower from the fountain, let's just draw that line in, bell tower from the fountain is that line there. So what direction is this line going in? It's 140 degrees more than the bearing of the statue from the fountain. So it's going to be more. It's this bit here, isn't it? You're adding on to it, this bit. So that's going to be 140 in there. So write down in terms of x, the bearing of the bell tower from the fountain. Well, that's going to be those two things added together. I didn't write that in very nicely there. Let's just make that a bit neater. So that... That was meant to say 140, okay? So then that entire angle then is going to be the x plus the 140, okay? So that is the bearing of the, the bell tower from the fountain. The bearing of the bell tower from the fountain is also three times the bearing of the statue from the fountain. Work out the bearing of the bell tower from the fountain. Well, 3 times the bearing of the statue is 3 lots of x, isn't it? So what we're saying here then, the bearing of the bell tower, which we already found was x plus 140, we're now told that that's going to be the same thing as 3x, 3 times the bearing of the statue from the fountain. So what we've got here is we've got a linear equation in x we can go on to solve. So got x plus 140 is 3x. If I take x away from both sides to start with, that'll cancel that one off there. Leave me with 140 is equal to 2x. And then dividing both sides by 2, that's going to leave me with x is equal to 70 then, isn't it? 70 degrees. Question 6. Morgan is playing a computer game. They can score 0, 1, 2 or 3 points on each turn. They record their scores for 100 turns. The table shows the relative frequency of their scores. So uh, we've got the relative frequency of 0, 1 and 2, but 3 is missing and part A says complete the table. Okay. Now, first up, the relative frequencies of all the possible outcomes must be equal to 1. This is kind of the rule of completion. Okay. 
So therefore, the probability or the relative frequency of getting a 3 is going to be 1 minus the other 3. Then this is 1 minus 0 0.08 uh, plus 0.42 plus 0.38. Okay, well, so what is that then? So 0 0.08, 0 0.42, and 0 0.38. That adds up to 8, 16, 18. Carry 1. 1, 4, and 3 give me 8. Uh, so that's 0 0.88 then, isn't it? So 1 minus 0 0.88. What's that? Uh, that's 0 0.12. So that's my relative frequency of getting uh, a 3. Okay. Now, part B says, Morgan says, I scored more than 160 points in total in my 100 turns. Is Morgan correct? Show how you decide. Okay. Now, if he uh, played 100 turns and they were the relative frequencies, then that means if I multiply each one of those by 100, I'll get the number of times that he got those scored. Um, so 0 0.8 times 100 is 8. 0 0.42 times 100 is 42. That's going to be 38, and that's going to be 12. Okay, so that's the number of times uh, he got each one of those scores in 100 turns. Okay, uh, so then what's the total of those? And I can kind of multiply them up now then, can't I? I can say uh, total is going to be uh, 0 times 8 plus 1 times 42 plus 2 times 38 plus 3 times 12. Okay, and that gives me 0 plus 42 plus 76 plus 36. What's that come to? Well, 76 and 36 is 112 plus 42 makes 154. Okay, is that right? 36 and 76 is 112, uh, 150, yeah, 154. Okay, so is that more than 160 points? No, it's not. Uh, so Morgan is wrong as 154 is less than 160. Okay, question eight. A bag only contains red marbles, blue marbles, and yellow marbles. The probability of picking a red marble is two fifths. There are nine yellow marbles. The probability of picking a blue marble is three times as likely as picking a yellow one. Okay. Uh, uh, work out the total number of marbles in the bag. You must show your work in. Okay, so if we did that in a table, I'm just going to make a quick table with uh, colouring and the, the probabilities that we know. Okay, so beep. So colour, probability. Uh, so we've got red and we've got yellow. What's the other colour? Uh, blue. Blue. Okay. Uh, so we know, what do we know? We know the probability of picking red is two-fifths. And we know that the probability of picking a blue one is three times as likely as picking a yellow one. So if we said let the probability of picking a yellow one be x, then the probability of picking a blue one would be three times as much. It would be three x, wouldn't it? Okay. Now, with probability, uh, all of those need to add up to one, don't they? So my... Uh, two fifths plus my x plus my three x needs to be equal to one because of the law of completion. Okay, so x plus three x is four x, uh, and if I take two fifths away from both sides, I'm going to get four uh, x is equal to three fifths on the other side. One minus two fifths is three fifths. Uh, dividing both sides by four, I'm going to end up with x equals three over twenty. Okay. So, what does that mean? That means yellow, probability of getting a yellow one is going to be 3 out of 20. So that's 3 out of 20, and that's 9 out of 20. Okay? Right, and then so work out the total number of marbles in the bag then. Then if, like, the total number of marbles was T, then, then I guess then the, if, there are nine, if there are 9 yellow marbles and 3 20ths of the marbles are yellow, then 3 20ths of the total is equal to 9 then, isn't it? So if 3 20ths of the total is equal to 9, then the total number of marbles is going to be... So cross multiplying, if I move the 20 up there and the nine down, or the 3 down here, I can rearrange that and say uh, T then is 9 times 20 over 3. So 
cancel the 3 into the 9 gives me 3. Uh, 3 times 20, that's 60 then. So uh, altogether then we had 60 marbles to start with. So that's 60 marbles. That's the total. Question 19, part A. Circle the value of sine 30. Now, you need to be able to remember this table of um, values for sine, cosine, and tangent. Uh, now, you either just memorize it line by line, or there's a kind of easier way to remember it uh, for those people who struggle with remembering things. So I've got to show you the easy way. So we've got angles. We need to know the angles 0, 30, 45, 60, and 90 for sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay? Uh, now the sine ones go root 0, root 1, root 2, root 3, root 4, over 2, over 2, over 2, over 2, over 2. The cosine ones are the same but backwards, so that would be like root 4 over 2, root 3 over 2, root 2 over 2, root 1 over 2, and root 0 over 2. And then the tangent one is the sine values divided by the cosine values. Okay, so you're going to get uh, root 0 over root 4, root 1 over root 3, root 2 over root 2, root 3 over root 1, and root 4 over root 0. Okay, now we want sine 30 that's the only one we want so it's going to be sine 30 it's going to be that one there then isn't it root 1 over 2 so what's root 1 over 2 root 1 over 2 well the root of 1 is just 1 so that's the same thing as a half so it's just that one there isn't it okay so you need to remember this table uh, I've shown you a good way to work out or to memorize it I would suggest that you do because otherwise you're not going to be able to answer these questions. You need to go on to use the answer in uh, this second one, work out the value of x. Okay, so this is a trigonometry question. Now, this is the opposite side, because it's opposite the marked angle. This is the hypotenuse, because it's the longest side. This is the adjacent, which we don't care about, we don't need. Okay, so writing down our mnemonic for trigonometry, Sokatoa. I think the easiest way of picking the right one is thinking about which side we don't need, which is A, and just getting rid of all the ones that have got A in it. So it's not the calf part because that's got an A in it, and it's not the toa part because that's got an A in it. It's got to be the soft part there, isn't it? It's going to be the sine. So sine of my angle theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Okay, so then what's what then? So the angle theta, that's my 30 degree angle there, isn't it? So sine 30 is equal to the opposite, that's the thing we're trying to find, it's x divided by the hypotenuse, which is there, the, the h, which is 24. Okay, uh, right, so just rearranging that in terms of x. So then x is going to be just multiplying through both sides by 24. I'm going to get x is equal to 24 sine 30. But we were just looking at what sine 30 was. Remember, sine 30 was a half. So that's actually x then is going to be 24 times a half, which is 12. Okay, so x is just 12. Question 20. The graph shows a parallelogram ABCD. A has coordinates 0, minus 6, B has coordinates 3, 0, and C has coordinates 9, 0. Find the equation of the line that passes through points C and D. Give your answer in the form y equals mx plus c. You must show your working. Okay. Now, to find the equation of a straight line, you either need to know the gradient and a point on the line, or you need to know two points on the line so you can find the gradient. Okay. Now, at the moment, we only know one point on the line, and that's C, that's at the coordinates 9, 0, isn't it? What we want to do is we want to work out what D is, what the coordinates of D are. Now, can we do that? Now, we know the distance between B and C is the difference between 3 and 9. That that's has, has a span of 6, doesn't it? So that means, because it's a parallelogram, 
and this side is the same length as this side, then this distance here also needs to be 6. So as this coordinate over here was 0 minus 6, and I'm going to be adding 6 to the x coordinate, this one is going to be 6 minus 6 then, that's the coordinate for d. So now I know two coordinates on my line, I can work out the gradient. Gradient m is going to be change in y divided by change in x. Okay, so if I imagine a little triangle between d and c, how far is it upwards that, uh, in the direction of y? Well, the y coordinate up here is 0 and the y coordinate down here is minus 6. So the difference between them is 6. And in the other direction, in the change in x direction, I've got 9 and 6. They've got a difference of 3. Okay, so subbing that into my formula, the change in y then, that's going to be my 6 there. That's the change in y. And then the change in x, that's going to be the 3 there then. Okay, so 6 divided by 3. What's that? 6 divided by 3, well, that's just 2, isn't it? Okay, so that means the gradient of my line is 2, m is 2. So, therefore, equation of the line is going to be of form y equals m, but we know m is 2, y equals 2x plus c. Okay, so we knew it was in the form y equals mx plus c, and we already found m we found m to be 2 so that goes there so then the next thing we need to do is work out the value of c so what's c now to work out c we just need to substitute one of the coordinates into our partial equation i'm going to take the coordinate c because it was given and it's the easy one of the two so i'm going to say because one of them is zero basically so it's going to be easier maths so i'm going to say it passes through the point 9, 0. So subbing in x is 9, y is 0 into this equation, I'm going to get 0 is equal to 2 lots of 9 plus c. It's a bit like what we were doing earlier with the inverse proportion question where we had a k unknown, we needed to find it and we subbed in two values. We're doing the same thing here. Uh, if we sub in x and y values, the only thing we don't know is c. Uh, so that gives me 0 equals 18 plus c. So C then is going to be minus 18 then, isn't it? Okay, so therefore, equation, the complete equation, is Y is equal to 2X plus, sorry, not plus, minus, minus 18. Okay, so we found the gradient. It was 2, and we found the intercept. It was here, look, minus 18. So now we subbed it in there. So y equals 2x minus 18. All done. Lovely. Question 21a. I've got x plus 4 times x plus 3, and that's equal to x squared plus 7x plus 12. So I've got like a factorized quadratic is equal to the expanded quadratic. Now Darcy says the statement of the box is an equation. Ellis says the statement of the box is an identity. One of them is correct. Explain which one of Darcy or Ellis is correct. Now, the difference between an equation and an identity is an equation is true for particular values of x or for your unknown, but identities are true for all values. Now, in this case, x plus 4 times x plus 3 is equal to x squared plus 7x plus 12 for all values of x. Okay, if you multiplied that out, you would get x squared plus 7x plus 12. If you then decided what the value of x was, then it would, it would work no matter what values you put in. So I think that Ellis is correct. And the reason is because it is true for all values of x. Okay? Uh, now, the next part says solve by factorizing. Now, x squared, x squared plus 4x minus 12 equals 0. Now, that's an equation. This is true for a couple of particular values of x. It's not true for every value. Okay. So, can I factorize it? What is the... When I factorize, I, I usually start with the 
this number here, the 12 on the end, what are the factor pairs of 12? I've got uh, factor pairs of 12, 1 and 12, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. They're all the different factor pairs. Now, I want one that has a difference of 4, because 12 is negative, so it's the difference between the two. And I can see one pair that fits, and that's this one here, the 2 and the 6. Now, to make x 4x positive, it's the bigger one that needs to be the positive one. So that's going to be x plus 6, x minus 2, like that. Okay. So then if I've got x plus 6, x minus 2 is equal to 0, then that means that x must be equal to minus 6, or x must be equal to 2. So the, the sign of your answer is always flipped from how it looks in the brackets. So minus 6 and 2. Question 9. The diagram shows the scale drawing of a sandpit ABCD. It also shows the arc of all points in the sandpit that are 80 centimetres from the corner A. We're told that the scale of 1 centimetre represents 20 centimetres. A game is played by throwing a ball into the sandpit. Points may be scored when the ball lands in the sandpit. One point if the ball lands within the 80 centimetres of corner A and... One point if the ball is closer to side AB than to side AD. And one point if the ball is closer to corner A than it is to corner B. By completing the construction, find and shade the regions where two points can be scored. Show all of your construction lines. All right, uh, now, the first construction is already done for us, isn't it? So the, the, the one where it has to be within 80 centimeters from corner A, that, semi, that circle has already been drawn. It's that arc, isn't it, there? Uh, yeah, so you can see this one is, is 4 centimetres, which is 80. So that has already been done. So I'm going to move on to the second one, uh, which says one point if the ball is closer to side AB than AD. Okay, so the construction that we need for the points that are equidistant from two lines is the angle bisector of those two lines. Okay, so what we're going to have to do is construct the angle bisector. Uh, now, normally, I would put the compass at A first and do an arc that cuts both, but we've already got this handy uh, arc already drawn, so I'm just going to use those two points to mark my cross in the middle to make the angle bisector. Okay, so that makes my job a little bit easier. So sticking on either end, we're drawing a little arc, and then where they cross, that is going to be where my angle bisector is going to go through. Okay, so the line I'm drawing... Uh, are all the points that are equidistance away from those two lines. So clearly if I want it to be closer to AB, then I want it to be below that line there then. Right, next construction. The point of uh, if the ball lies closer to A than, uh, than to B. So the points that are equidistant from two given points A and B are going to be the perpendicular the bisector of that line. Okay, so in order to draw a perpendicular bisector, I'm going to set my compass to a little bit over halfway between those two points. And I'm going to draw an arc uh, with the compass based at B. Okay, a bit of a semicircle going on there. And then switch over to A, and I'm going to draw another semicircle. We should find that they meet in two places. Okay, it's a little bit off screen. Let me just push it up a bit. So you're drawing a line through the where those two arcs crossed. That is, that's going to be my perpendicular bisector. So all of those points uh, are equidistant from A and B. Okay, so if we want the points that are closer to A, then I want the points to the left of that line. As I said earlier, if I want the points that are closer to the line AB than the, than the points AD, then I want those below the angle bisector. Okay. Uh, now, in this case, I want the, I then want the ones outside of the circle then, because if it was inside the circle, it would be worth three points. But I want, to, I want to highlight the ones that are just worth two points. Uh, so inside the circle would, would meet all three conditions, and then they'd be worth three points. Now, is there any other place which 
is worth two points. This one here is, isn't it? Because that's inside the circle and closer to um, A than to B. So that's worth two points. Uh, what other regions have we got? Uh, this one up here is only worth one one point because it's closer to A than B, but doesn't meet any of the other conditions. And that one down there is worth one uh, because it's closer to A, B than A, D. And the one at the top is worth zero because it doesn't meet any of the conditions. Right, so they're the two regions that I want, uh, and I've shaded both, so that's job done. Let's move on. You can find more exam question compilations over here. For more past paper walkthroughs, click down here. If you want to visit my Amazon shop with my recommendations for calculators, revision guides and other maths related stuff, click down here. Good luck in your revision and in your exams and see you again next time.